We have joining us a very special person. Um, Professor Good Pearl in the Physics and Astronomy Department was actually Professor Samani's research advisor during his PhD program here. And to, yeah. <laughs> And before I pass the mic on to Professor Good Pearl, I would like to provide some background on him. Um, he grew up in Germany. He had his PhD in England. Actually, he got it in, at Cambridge University, during which he was also awarded the JT Knight Prize, as well as the Roosevelt Travel Fellowship. Uh, prior to joining our UCLA faculty in 2003, Professor Good Pearl conducted postdoctoral research at Princeton, Harvard, and Stanford University. And since 2003, Professor Good Pearl has spread his invaluable knowledge, not just here on campus at UCLA, but also around the country at Johns Hopkins University, as well as Caltech. And uh, so if you can all just give me a round of applause and please welcome me and join me, <laughs> Professor Michael Good Pearl. Thank you. Uh, good evening. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Joshua Samani who is the recipient of the 2017 My Last Lecture Award of the UCLA Alumni Scholars Club. I've known Josh for about nine years and have been his PhD advisor from 2010 to 2014. So the German language often has single words for which the English language needs a whole sentence to convey a similar meaning. The most famous example is probably Schadenfreude, which means getting pleasure out of the misfortune of others. There's a different, more cheerful one, which applies to me and my relation to Josh, and that's uh, Dr. Vater, so, or Dr. Mutter. Yeah, that means uh, basically PhD father, Dr. Father. I mean, nominally it means PhD advisor, but it also conveys that the relationship, I mean, between me and Josh is um, really a deeper and more lasting one than just one of a student uh, to his advisor. So it, it is with enormous pride of a Dr. Father that I'll introduce Josh for this award. So I'll give a bit of background about uh, Josh. Yeah, Josh grew up in Southern California, as a, and as a child, he was very curious about science. This affinity uh, was always nurtured by his supportive parents, uh, Sherwin and uh, Assis. And uh, after high school, uh, he left uh, sunny Southern California and went up to north to um, UC Berkeley, where he graduated in 2008 yeah, with a BA in physics and a BS in mathematics. But then I think Southern California uh, introduced its pull again and he came back to UCLA as a graduate student in the Department of um, Physics and Astronomy, where I had the good fortune you know, of having him as uh, my graduate student. I have to say Josh was a fantastic student. He was reliable, he was inquisitive, and he was creative. Yeah? We worked, and I mean, this is my research area, and Josh worked on the rather esoteric topic of um, string theory and the gauge gravity uh, correspondence. Uh, in the course of his PhD work, uh, among other uh, papers, we wrote two papers together. And uh, working with him was a really rewarding experience, yeah? uh, and uh, meaning that I learned a lot from him. So, but actually, Josh had a secret which I was, uh, as his advisor, completely unaware of. So his secret came to light first, uh, a couple of months in working with him, and that happened during the physics and astronomy holiday party. So at this, well, I'm not, it's completely P PG, what I'm saying. Um, so at these, at these parties, and we do this every year, uh, awards are given for excellence in teaching, both to faculty and um, to uh, TAs. And so uh, George actually got the TA Award of the Year. So I did not pay too much mind uh, initially this first time. I mean, everybody can get lucky once. <laughs> but I grew more and more suspicious over the years because this pattern repeated itself over and over and at each party, George received TA award after TA award. When it came time to finish his PhD, I had plans for Josh. Get a postdoc, continue research in string theory. But he fessed up that his true passion really lies in teaching, and especially in finding new ways and to innovate uh, teaching. So like a real parent, 
when confronted with the divergence of the plans you and your academic offspring have for their careers, I was initially dismayed, but eventually supported Josh following his passion. This decision was theoretical physics loss, but UCLA students gain, I think. Since the la for the last three years, Josh has been a lecturer at the Department of Physics and Astronomy, and he has taught a wide variety of courses, both introductory courses for physics majors and engineers, life science uh, and for life science majors. He has also taught upper division courses for physics majors. In addition, in the last two years, he has um, developed a new course which introduces um, computational physics into the upper division curriculum, which has been really well received. Um, and it's clear, whatever he teaches, the students love his classes. I have asked many students I've taught myself, and I universally get a response, Josh's class is the best they've ever taken. A common thread in all his teaching is that Josh is passionate about fin finding simple and effective ways of teaching, difficult physics and mathematics. He is using innovative technology to improve the teaching, and he constructs a collaborative learning environment. This makes both the teaching and the learning these subjects easier and more productive. He is also taking a leadership role in the department and the university of bringing these innovative ideas and innovative pedagogy to science classes all through the campus. And that, in that way, he makes me and my colleagues better teachers. He serves on the Committee for Physics uh, in Undergraduate Education for the American Association of Physics Teachers. He is an active contributor to the Partnership for Integration of Computation in Undergraduate Physics, and he is an instructional consultant for the UCLA Center of Education, Innovation, and Learning in the Science. So I can really say that UCLA is very, very lucky to have him as a professor. So without further ado, let me join his parents, uh, his sister Michelle, his wonderful wife Nancy, his colleagues and his students in congratulating Josh to the 2017 My Last Lecture Award of the U UCLA Alumni Scholarship. How's this volume? Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you, Michael. That was a really, really beautiful introduction. Um, so I want to thank a few people before I start. Uh, first of all, the Alumni Scholars Club, thank you for this great honor. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here and have some time to share whatever I want to with, with students. Um, Eunice Lee, who is the Vice President of the Alumni Scholars Club, uh, she helped me so much with email communication and making sure clickers were working, working well. So let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> of course, all of my friends who came to support me, thank you so much. My family, my dad Aziz, my mom Shervin, my sister Michelle, of course, whose love and support always means so much to me. My extremely talented students, who many of you were here, I'm sure, voted for me, so thank you for that. And uh, really, I mean, students make every single day that I come to UCLA really, really a joyful thing for me, so thank you for that as well. And last but not least, my wife, Nancy, who's here. <laughs> and as many of you know, if you've taken my classes, Nancy is a recurring uh, character in problems, so if you want to see the real Nancy, in, in real life, she's actually here today. All right, my last lecture. This is going to be fun. So when I first got the email about my last lecture, I had kind of this sort of reaction. I thought, you know, I'm, I'm not thinking of retiring anytime soon. I feel pretty healthy. I thought I was doing a pretty good job. This, this seems a little premature. But, but as it turns out, actually, um, 
I started thinking, well, if, if it were my last day on Earth, which is kind of a morbid thought, but what would I actually want to talk about? And I remembered that uh, thinking about the end, so to speak, is actually a very useful thing. And actually, one of my favorite quotes is from Steve Jobs, who said that facing our mortality causes us to reflect, determine what we care about, and pursue it from a clearer, often fresher perspective. And this is exactly what happened with me. And in fact, I started thinking about what I cared about, and here's what I came to. So there's two things I especially care about, two of the things I care about, learning science, especially physics, and sharing what I've learned. Those are the two, thing, two of the things I really care most deeply about in the world. And I wanted to give you some context for why it became this way. So we're going to start from the beginning. So this is me in my crib. I don't know how old I am here. Uh, but I actually think I look pretty curious even in this, in this picture here, too. So after, after this point, um, there was a lot of sleeping. I didn't really do very much physics in the first few years of my life. There's something kind of strange about this picture. I don't know why, but I don't have any sheets or... Uh, <laughs> also, also uh, the pillow was really dirty. I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> in any case, I, I seem fast asleep, so I'm sure I was fine. Then uh, I started to get an education. This is my fourth grade class. This is actually Miss Monroe over here. She's a really, really good teacher. When I think back to some of my best teachers of all time, uh, this is definitely one of them. She used to read Roald Dahl books to us during class. And I think that's where I first understood what it meant to tell a story. Like, you know, what, what sorts of things should you be doing when you're telling a story to make it an engaging story? And I brought this to my teaching, I think. And, uh, well, here's a close-up. This is me. Time Weitzman Community Day School, grade four. And I'll say this, there's a person in this row who's actually very famous. But I'm not gonna tell you who it is. I'll just, I'll just stay on here for a few minutes, for a couple, few seconds, if you can take a look. There's, there's a pretty famous person here. <laughs> aside, aside from me. I'm not gonna tell you who it is, though. In fact, I, I will never reveal who it is, so this is your last chance to Commit this to memory. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was drafted to the YMCA. Not exactly the most diverse basketball team, as you can see. Uh, although, if you look at the first row, it's a pretty, pretty good. What's, what's really funny about this picture is that this is like the exact ratios in my high school. Actually, actually, maybe, maybe this ratio, this, this is a little bit uh, large. The one third of, well, whatever you want to call me. So after this point, I did a, a few other things. Uh, I started a business. This is me selling orange juice in front of my childhood home. And if you look closely, you'll see what my marketing strategy was. One cup orange juice for 50 cents. Buy one, get one free. And then here it says, good orange juice. <laughs> Which I think is probably not the best strategy, but I actually do remember selling a lot of orange juice that day. So you can see that I'm scooping ice from a thermos into some cup or something. And this is the orange juice right here. I actually started another business. This is, me sh this is me shining shoes for my dad. I call it a business because he did actually pay me to do this, if I remember. I think I got something like 50 cents per shoe, something like that. Also, you know, at some point I started getting into physical fitness and... <laughs> That's me. There's another person in this picture. You actually can see the elbow. That person's in this room, but I'm not going to show the rest of the picture. So uh, I built a lot of Legos. And this is an Ice Planet Lego, one of my favorite ones. It was part of a big Ice Planet series. I wanted all of the Ice Planet Legos, but I think I only ever bought one of them because 
I used to save up for like a year or two to get each Lego I wanted to get. I also started a rocket company. This is a, a rocket car that I built for fun uh, with my friend Jonathan Simmons, who I actually showed this picture to the other day, and he laughed really hard. Um, you know, we actually used to launch this in our, on our street, like down my street in front of my house, which, looking back, is really dangerous, probably illegal. I, I'm kind of surprised that I didn't get in big trouble for this. Uh, but it just so happens that this thing still exists. And here it is. Let's see? <laughs> it's still... <laughs> It still works really well. I realized, actually, that the reason why it works so well is that someone smart, I don't know who, hung this on the wall vertically, and so it never collected any dust. It was really clean. All the wheels are, you know, functioning really well. So if you want to take a look at this after the lecture, feel free. What else happened? Well, I was seduced by math at some point. This is actually a page from one of my elementary school yearbooks. You can see that my favorite author was Jack London, of all authors. I don't know why Jack London. I think I did a book report on Call of the Wild, which is my favorite book, apparently, too. I guess I didn't listen to any music and <laughs> didn't like any, any groups. Uh, uh, my favorite four was basketball. My favorite movie was James Bond's Gold, Goldfinger. Uh, <laughs> superhero, Superman. Hobby, violin, collecting coins, slash stamps, slash rocks. <laughs> <laughs> and I seemingly didn't really know what I wanted to be when I grew up. But, but the main point here is that I was seduced by math. We had a lot of fun together. But there was a point where I discovered biology. This is one of my science fair projects from elementary school on DNA. I really enjoyed this project, but it wasn't meant to be. Because another science caught my eye, and of course, you probably know what that is, physics. This is another of my projects on how electromagnets work. And basically, this was a crane, and it was attached to this 12-volt battery here. And you would lower the crane into a box of paper clips, I think. And the electromagnet would pick up the paper clips, and you could move them around. So I, I got seduced by physics more so than math, in fact. And, uh, I was really hooked on physics. Really from the first time where I can remember learning any real physics, I just absolutely loved physics. There was something about the way that physics explores really fundamental aspects of the world, about the universe, that really appealed to me. And I liked math, so physics is a very mathematical science. So I really got hooked on physics. And for the next, next many years, I studied physics at varying levels of difficulty. So in high school, I did honors physics and then AP physics, and I got even more into physics. And then in college, I majored in physics, and then I went to grad school for physics, and I was immersed in physics for so many years, and I really just loved it, and pretty much all I ever wanted to think about. And at some point, I realized that there were so many beautiful things I was learning, and I really, really just wanted to share these things with people. So, you know, in grad school, you get to do that as a TA, and you share things with your friends, et cetera, but as a lecturer, I really started feeling like I had a platform to share these really beautiful ideas with people, and find really nice ways of explaining them to people so they could appreciate the beauty as well. And in retrospect, there was actually a point earlier in my trajectory where I found out that I was good at communicating. I hadn't remembered this until I was thinking about this lecture, but it turns out that I found this grading rubric, this grading rubric from a speech class I took the summer before seventh grade. And so you can see it's a speech to persuade, speech evaluation form. And my speech was on capital punishment. I actually remember this. I was arguing in support of capital punishment, since I've actually reversed my opinion. But I was arguing in support of capital punishment. And you can see here that this is actually the first public speech I ever gave. And apparently I did a good job. I got tens in choice of topic, introduction, informative facts, pronunciation, volume, rate, organization, eye contact, conclusion, knowledge of the topic. Apparently I did a pretty good job. Here's a close-up of the last bit, which I thought was actually a really great rubric. Was it evident the speaker was prepared? Yes. Did the speaker appear to be comfortable with the topic? Yes. Did the speaker convince you or change your mind? Yes, but he agreed with my position already. 
Do you think the speaker believes in his idea, or in the ideas of the product? Yes. Did the speaker have statistics? Yes. Did the speaker use any quotations from reliable, authoritative sources? Yes. So it seems like I already was primed for giving some sort of scientific communication. Because these things like, you know, giving statistics or quotations from reliable sources, these are, these are all sort of important things when you're doing science. Okay, so, you know, you might think that giving a lecture isn't so bad. On some level, all you do is you just stand up there and you talk about something. However, that's not necessarily the case. You may know this scene. In 1930, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the, anyone, anyone? Great Depression, passed the, anyone, anyone? The tariff bill, the Hawley-Smoot Tariff Act, which anyone raised or lowered? raised tariffs in an effort to collect more revenue for the federal government. Did it work? Anyone? Anyone know the effects? It did not work, and the United States sank deeper into the Great Depression. Today, we have a similar debate over this. Anyone know what this is, class? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone seen this before? The Laffer Curve. Anyone know what this says? It says that at this point, on the revenue curve, you will get exactly the same amount of revenue as at this point. This is very controversial. Does anyone know what Vice President Bush called this in 1980? <laughs> anyone? Something D-O-O -O economics. Voodoo economics. So clearly, uh, there are bad ways to give a lecture. So, after you've seen something like that, you might ask the question, well, what exactly is an engaging lecture? And moreover, what's a lecture that maximizes learning? Because they aren't necessarily the same thing. I could run around naked up here and probably engage everyone, <laughs> which I'm not going to do. But if I actually want to teach you something in the process, that's a, that's a harder thing to do. So the question is, how do, you, how do you both engage people and maximize learning? And in the last three years, I've learned a lot about education research. And there are a lot of buzzwords that people throw around in education research and a lot of great research that's done. But when I really think about it, all of it comes down to basically the following quotation, which I have actually on my wall in my office if you ever walk in. Maybe you've noticed it before. It's one quotation that apparently is usually attributed to Benjamin Franklin, but is actually from an ancient Chinese text from thousands of years ago. So people knew about this a really long time ago, far before education research. And here's the, here's the distillation of the quote. So tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. I've highlighted involve here because what I've learned is that there's really only one way to really learn something deeply, and that's for you to do it yourself. So everything I do when I teach is trying to get students involved to the maximal extent possible, either during lecture or outside of lecture, et cetera, so that they're doing as much on their own, they're as involved as possible, and I think that's when the real learning happens. So I want to give a big thank you to iClicker, the iClicker company, who donated, or not donated, I should say, they've loaned clickers for, I think, everyone in the audience, so let's give them a round of applause. Because we have clickers now where I can ask you guys questions during the lecture and both engage you and we can have some sort of a meaningful learning experience because you're going to be involved. So I want to do a test, but before I do, make sure you turn your clicker on. The way you do that is that there should be a button, like an on-off button, that you press and hold. And if you have a clicker with a screen on it, then the clicker should display a double A because my receiver is on frequency double A. If you don't have a screen on it, then make sure that you press and hold the power button and press A, A, and that's all. It should engage the right frequency, and then you're ready to go for voting. Does anyone have any questions about how that works? 
A lot of people here have used clickers before, so. <laughs> One of my learning assistants can't get her clicker to work, apparently. Is it the battery? The battery's maybe dead. Okay. So we're gonna do a test. I have an interesting trivia question for you. It's actually something I've done in my classes before. So we're gonna start the voting. As you can see, that it, it counts the number of people who have voted so far. And we're, we're gonna see in a moment how good you are at movie trivia. Okay, make sure you voted. Here are the results. I thought this was gonna happen. A lot of people chose The Lion King, great movie. We all saw The Lion King, love that movie. However, I just wanna give you a minute to reconsider <laughs> and discuss with the person next to you and try to come to a consensus and re-vote. All right, I'll give you a few more seconds to re-vote. Hopefully people didn't look this up on their phone. Did you look it up on your phone? Okay, good, good. Don't look it up, it's gonna ruin it. All right, let's see the results. Uh-huh. <laughs> Almost a dead heat between, let's see what the choices were. Okay, so we have a dead heat between Beauty and the Beast and Pinocchio. I will tell you that one of these is the correct answer. We'll just do one more round of voting. <laughs> okay, let's see what you thought. Hmm. Interesting. This is a very hard question, it seems. It, it turns out that the answer is actually C. It is Beauty and the Beast. So, all right. Okay, so that was, that was, just, that was just to get us started. Now, the rest of the talk is gonna be about physics. And uh, I know that some of you may be, may be a little bit sick of physics by now. Probably 6A students definitely are sick of it. There was a midterm yesterday. Uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, what I realized, as I said earlier, is that one of the things I really deeply care about is learning and sharing physics. And I was really just trying to think for so long, weeks, about what topic I would talk about. And I thought of some kind of esoteric topics that I thought maybe I could explain to people, even, even though they were sort of complicated. Uh, but then I, f I found the perfect one. And the thing that's great about this topic is that it's gonna reveal to you something that is extremely fundamental about the universe. And it pertains to something that most people, even if they don't know, know very much physics, can understand. And it forms the basis for a lot of modern physics with some modification, you can use the same idea that I'm gonna talk about here to really form the basis for fundamental particle physics even, it turns out. So you're gonna learn a really, really deep concept today. And I'm gonna try my very best to make this very deep concept as accessible and simple as possible, just so we can get a really good intuition for it. So here's the beginning of physics. So here's what's going on. This is a space station, way out in outer space, and this is Alice. Alice is a scientist on this space station. She's doing some experiments. The thing is that Alice has gotten pretty bored. She's been doing experiments a lot, and she really needs a break. So she decided to take a spacewalk, and so she put on her spacesuit and is, is doing a bit of a spacewalk. As you can tell, she's having a really good time. You can see that on the space station there's a little antenna so she can communicate with the space station and send it data, stuff like that. Now, when Alice gets really bored and goes on spacewalks, oftentimes she wants to also do a little bit of meditation to relax. And so even though her spacesuit has a propulsion system that can kind of jet her around, sometimes she likes to turn off the propulsion system, close her eyes and just float in space. 
So here's what happens. She does this, she turns off her propulsion system, she starts floating in space. And the space station knows that she's done this, so the space station starts tracking her position as a function of time. Because we're concerned that if she falls asleep, say, maybe she'll float too far away from the space station, that wouldn't be good. We want to keep track of where she is, and just in case she gets too far, we want to make sure to send her a little signal and wake her up, for example. Or maybe just bring her back to the space station. So that's the setup. Are there any questions about the setup? Pretty simple thus far, I think. The space station is way out in outer space. It's isolated from, from all other things in the universe. All right, so I'm gonna ask you a question now about the situation. So think for a moment to yourself about this question. Don't discuss the answer with anyone. Just try to come up with your own answer. I'll give you a minute or two to do that. Okay, I'll give you a few more seconds. All right, we had about 350 votes, and roughly 150 people got this wrong. Excuse me. <laughs> so, I'd like you to take two minutes, turn to the person next to you, discuss this, and see if you can come to a consens consensus and revote. All right, see what you all thought. So, if you've taken my classes, you know that there's this effect that when people discuss things with each other, even though I've, I've had no input in the audience whatsoever, Somehow, the right answer seems to get distilled out of that conversation pretty much every time. And this is no exception. So, B is in fact the correct answer. Would someone from 6A, that's currently in 6A, like to explain why they think this position, knowing Alice's position only, is not enough. Like, maybe you can explain... Well, I'll, I'll stop there. For extra credit? <laughs> Go ahead. Hmm. Okay, so, so you're saying that if you just know where they're starting, they could, for example, go off in this direction at some, a certain speed, but they could go off at some other speed. We don't know. We don't know, for example, what the speed is. So we can't really predict what the motion's gonna look like just by knowing the position. We need at least to know, for example, the speed. Okay. So that's true. I have a follow-up question to that, though. We know that at least we need to know the speed. We need to know how fast she's going at that initial time. Okay. I think, I think that the way you explained it actually was so thorough that you ruined the clicker question. Thank you very much. All right. So in fact, I'll show you the results here. B is the correct answer. And it kind of ruins my follow-up question to this follow-up question. But can you reiterate what the second part was that makes it so this one is now? You need the direction as well. So if you know the position, her initial position, and you know her speed, and you know in what direction she's originally going, then you can, you're saying, predict. Okay. So that's true. All right, so there's one last question. So I'm going to skip this one and just go to this one. Okay, I'm going to stop it. You guys are pretty good at this. So, 
It is in fact D. Oh, sorry, excuse me, E. <laughs> it is in fact E, not D. However, there were actually quite a lot of people who said C. Interestingly enough, 70, 70 people said C. I have a feeling that the reason why E was so many people is that a lot of people have taken physics with me. Because if you ask people in the general population which of these is the path, you're going to get a lot more C's, typically. On the other hand, maybe somebody here can explain why it is that C cannot be the right answer. And it preferably explain it in such a way that someone who doesn't know that much physics might be able to understand. Go ahead. Hmm. That's actually a really interesting way of thinking about think uh, thinking about it. Uh, and in some sense, the thing you just expressed underlies a very advanced field of physics called general relativity. It's kind of similar to what you said. Um, so you're saying basically that uh, if there weren't a, the straight path available, then you think maybe it would have been C. Like, if the object were forced to move along this curve somehow, it would be C. But since it has this really direct straight one available, it's just going to take that one. But why? Can you, can you explain it in, from a more fundamental or maybe somebody else can explain it. I'll allow you to use some physics now if you want, that you may have learned. Go ahead. Mm. I like that. I think I'm going to steal that from you. So you're saying you're, you're driving down the street in a straight line, presumably, and you're saying that if you're just like coasting down in a straight line, you're not going to be change, changing lanes un, un, unless something forces you to do that. In fact, the word force is suggestive, which I'm sure, I'm sure on some level you, you chose that for that reason. In fact, that's exactly the right idea, that Unless this object is forced off of this simpler path, it's going to stay on this straight line path. So if you want to be a little bit more precise about it, you might say something like this. You'd say, well, Newton, one of the great physicists of all time, basically tells us the answer. Because Newton, in, in fact, the second law, Newton's second law, basically tells us that the way that the motion of something, or the amount that the motion of something changes, is equal to the total force that thing feels divided by its mass. Now in this particular case, Alice is floating, so she feels no forces. So the numerator over here is zero, so that means that her motion doesn't change at all. What that means is that her speed won't change from the original, her original position. Her direction of travel won't change. So if her speed won't change, and her direction of travel won't change, she's going to keep on going in a straight line at that same speed, unless something forces her to change her path. In other words, unless a force acts on her. So that's the answer. That's the answer provided by Newton. Newtonian mechanics, it's called. That's what we teach in 6a and 1a. So this is what the path looks like. A straight line. These dots here indicate where she is at even time intervals. So you can see that her speed is remaining the same because for every interval of time, she's traveling the same distance. That's what those dots are. So that's what her path looks like. But here's the thing. This is where the really cool stuff starts. It turns out that there's a completely different way to look at this beyond forces. And it's a really big shame because you don't get to learn this unless you're a physics major. And it's really one of the highlights, it was one of the highlights for me as a physics major. There's a completely different way of thinking about why this happens that reveals something really beautiful and deep about the way the universe works. So that's what I want to share with you. And in fact, there was this guy, Pierre Maupertuis, who's a French, a French mathematician philosopher, 
And I did some research and I found that apparently he actually was the first person to think of this idea that I'm going to try to describe to you. And I'm going to try to reveal this idea to you, like we're peeling an onion, in three layers. There's three layers to this idea. Some of the layers you may be familiar with already because you may have taken a physics class, but I'm pretty sure that the vast majority of people here have never seen some of the layers of this onion. Very interesting onion. Here we go. Okay, there's the first layer is that I need to define a certain quantity called kinetic energy, which you may have encountered before. If you have an object that has a certain mass, and if it's traveling at a certain speed, then you can take one half times its mass times its speed times its speed, and you get this number. So at any given moment, you can calculate the kinetic energy of something as it's moving. You just have to know what its speed is, and you can, and once you know its mass, you just multiply these things in this way, and you compute the kinetic energy. Okay, sometimes you may have seen this in symbolic form like that. Kinetic energy is one half mb squared. So uh, I want to apply this, first of all, to get a feel for it to the situation where Alice is flowing. So I'm going to ask you another question. My 6A students will recognize this sort of question. It's an estimation question, which almost universally students absolutely despise. But it's an important skill because it gives you a sense of scale. So here's the question for you. All right. Let's see what y'all thought. I have to say that I'm impressed. Most people pick C, which is actually the right answer. It's a good estimate. So just, just in case you're used to pounds, say, even though pounds is a unit of force, but still we think of converting between kilograms and pounds in the United States, it's very confusing. If you want to think about it in pounds, 20 kilograms is roughly speaking 44 pounds. So you can eliminate B because it's too low. A is also too low. And then 2,000 kilograms is roughly the mass of a car. And then, of course, 20,000 kilograms is, is very large. So C is actually a good estimate. So if you wanted to apply this to Alice's scenario and compute Alice's kinetic energy, then you need an estimate for her speed. I'll just give my own estimate here. So we know kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared, 1 half the mass times the speed times the speed. And so I'm going to take 1 half times 200 kilograms, and I'm estimating her speed floating relative to the space station to be about 10 meters per second, which if you want to think in miles per hour is roughly 22 miles per hour. And if you do this, you multiply this all together. I chose really nice numbers here. And you get 10,000 joules. Joules is the unit of energy in international system units. So let's go to the next layer. All right, now, it's, it's a lecture honoring me. So <laughs> I decided to take a historically important physics quantity and name it after myself, because it's probably the only time I'll ever be able to do this. And I'm also kind of hoping secretly that this naming will catch on and you'll start talking about this quantity as Joshness and spread it around. OK, so here, here's the key to this new perspective on why the Alice was moving in the way that she was. Here's what we can do. In a moment, I'm going to tell you how to do this. But if you have any path that Alice might have taken, so you could consider some random path that Alice may have taken, even though she, we know she took the straight one, just consider some random path that you could have conceived from her initial point to her final point. It turns out you can calculate a number associated with this path, with any path. And we're calling this number the Joshness of the path. Different paths may have different Joshnesses, or they may have the same Joshness. But for every path, you can compute the Joshness. All right? Now, so the question is, how do you calculate the Joshness of the path? I'm going to tell you in a few steps. OK, first of all, what you need to do is you need to determine the initial time and the final time. So you need to have a clock, and you need to measure the time at which Alice turned off her propulsion system and started floating. Sorry, yeah, turned off her propulsion system, she started floating, and then there's a time, finally, where we're going to consider that to be a moment where, say, she wakes up and maybe she turns her propulsion system on again. 
but between t initial and t final, the initial time and the final time she's floating. So we need to figure out the initial and the final times. Now remember, this path that I've drawn here is not the actual path she travels on. We're just considering some path that could have been. Here's the next step. You need to break this path into a lot of little pieces, and we're going to take the pieces to be equal time pieces. So what I mean by that is, you see these dots here, these correspond to where Alice is after the initial time at equal time intervals. That's why, by the way, some of these lengths are smaller than others, because she may be going faster at some points. So if we chose equal time pieces, then over here where she's going faster, she's going to travel further. But over here where she's going slower, she's not going to travel as far. So these are equal time pieces that we've broken the path up into. All right. Once you do that, you need to calculate how long each of these pieces lasts. That's actually pretty simple. You just take the total time, which is t final minus t initial, and you divide by the number of pieces you have. And we're going to call the resulting little piece of time for that, the piece of the path that corresponds to all these equal time pieces. We're going to call that delta t. That's the Greek letter delta, which means change. So it's like the change in time from one dot to the next as he's traveling along these little pieces. Questions so far? Hopefully this is, this is okay. All right. Now, the next thing. For each of these pieces, we need to compute for kinetic energy on that piece. So I called that K. Now you may be worried about the fact that on each of these pieces, her speed could be changing. So what do I actually mean by her kinetic energy in the first place? Because the kinetic energy uses her speed at a given instant, but I'm computing the kinetic energy for a piece. How do I do that? Well, it turns out that, and you know this if you've taken a calculus class, but if you, if you take these pieces to be really small, then if these don't last very long, her speed isn't going to change very much during the piece. So it doesn't really matter. You could pick any of the speeds in this piece, and because her speed isn't changing very much, you can use that speed for k, and you basically will get the same thing. So we're going to assume that we just choose some speed in here, or if you wish, you can choose the average. It doesn't really matter to compute k for that segment, the kinetic energy for that segment. All right. Now what do we do with this? Now we get to Joshness. What you do is you take the k for each piece. Remember, we computed the k. We computed the delta t for each piece, the time it took. You compute the k for each piece, and you multiply by the delta t for that piece. And that's going to give you that number, the Joshness, but only for that piece. It's a pretty cool quantity, if I do say so myself. And then we're going to add them all up for all the pieces, k times delta t, k times delta t, k times delta t, and we get the total Joshness. OK, so, so I said earlier that for every path, you can associate this number. This is how you do it. You break it up. You calculate the time for each piece. You calculate kinetic energy for each piece. You multiply those two for each piece. You add them all together, and you're good to go. That's the number. Now, you may be worried that this depends on how many pieces you chose. I don't have that anywhere in this formula. You may be worried you'll get a different number if you chose a different number of pieces. And actually, you will. But if you take a really big, a large number of pieces, then your answer won't change very much if you take more. So as long as you pick a really large number of pieces, this number is pretty much always going to be the same. You just have to pick a lot of pieces. Well, what I just described basically is calculus, by the way. This is what we do again. We basically just did integration in calculus, but more the way maybe someone in Newton's time or someone a little bit later would have done it, without writing scary integration symbols. But that's really what we did. We integrated k along the path, it turns out. OK. That was layer two. So we know how to compute the Joshness for a path. There's one last layer. And here's where things start getting really interesting. In the next layer, you have to take <laughs> all of the possible paths you could have conceived. You have to imagine every possible path 
from her initial point to her final point. There's an infinite number of them. You have to think of all of them. And the correct one is a path that has a particular unique property. And that unique property involves something about the Joshness of that path. So what we need to do to figure out what path it is, is we need to compare the Joshness of every path and find the path with a certain unique Joshness to it. It's very fun. It's very fun to do this. Okay, just to, to summarize, consider every conceivable path Alice could have traveled on, not the one she actually did. You compute its Joshness, oh, the Joshness of each path. You compare all the Joshnesses to find the unique correct one. Now, I haven't told you what that property is yet because I want to show you a cool simulation that I wrote where we're going to discover it. I don't want to tell it to you. I want to discover it. Before I do that, though, are there any lingering questions about these layers? Yes. They're all the same. All the delta t's are the same. So because they're all the same, and because, because we know what the total time is, you can very simply calculate delta t. You just take the total time, and you divide by the number of pieces. So yeah, it's very simple in this case. I chose equal time pieces exactly for that reason. Yes, Michelle? <laughs> it, it, will, it is, I agree, it's very deep. I guess you could view it as life advice. We'll see. OK, I am now going to show, unless there are any other questions, we're now going to discover by watching, by interacting with a simulation, one of the really deepest facts in physics. It's really, really interesting. So I'll show you the simulation I wrote in Python. After all, I, I will, you know, tried to create this computational physics class. I might as well use Python, which is the language that we use. OK. So here's what I've done. I've written some code to automate those steps that I just showed you. Because say you have like a thousand pieces. For every one of those pieces, you have to compute the kinetic energy, which involves a bunch of multiplications, say. And you have to multiply that by delta t, another multiplication. You have to add them all up, which is a lot of additions. If you had to do this by hand, it would be really tedious and difficult to do, especially if you had a thousand pieces. You might be sitting there literally all day or all week doing it. But the most amazing thing is that we now have in our pockets computers that can do a billion of those operations every second. So you can easily compute the Joshness of an enormous number of paths using just your cell phone if you wanted to in a fraction of a second. Pretty amazing. So here's how the code works. So I have this code. It, like I said, it automates that process. And you can just ignore this stuff. But uh, I need to run the code here, so. All right. OK. Here's what the code does. The code is able to consider a lot of very strange looking paths. And I can do that using these sliders. See, like if I click on this slider here, the path gets wiggly but in a different way. And watch the Joshness value as I do this. See the Joshness changes. <laughs> now, also, by the way, I've written this so I can vary the n. N here is the number of time pieces I picked. Watch what happens when I do that. Now, here's what's really cool. Look, look, look at how when I make the number really big, this Joshness doesn't really change very much. That's what I was saying earlier. As long as you pick a lot of pieces, it doesn't really change very much. So it, I'm just going to pick some reasonable value then here. Okay. Now, I can also move around this other parameter here. And you can see the paths kind of get a little bit smaller. That. You can see the Joshness jump around. Now, I'm going to ask you to observe 
what's happening here very carefully as I vary this parameter. And see if you can see a pattern with the Joshness. Did anyone see anything interesting? <laughs> okay, look at this path here. The Joshness here is 536,000. That path has a Joshness of 68,000. Does anyone have a conjecture as to what it seems is happening? Go ahead. So your conjecture is that the Joshness is approaching zero as we approach the straight line, which we happen to know is the right answer. So you're saying that what you think is the answer here to the third layer is that you compare all of the Joshnesses and you find the one that has Joshness zero, and that's the right one. So you're kind of close. It's not exactly that. And just to show you this, I'm going to run a different simulation here. Here's what I, I can do with this, the rest of the code. So I can now compute the Joshness of an arbitrary number of curves, and I can have Python rank them according to Joshness. I could, I think here, do easily 100,000 or a million of them if I wanted, because this is a pretty fast computer. It's a new MacBook Pro. Now, I'm not going to do that many because it turns out that for the punchline, it really doesn't matter so much. So here, actually, I don't know if you can see this, but here I'm going to compute the Joshness. Actually, let's do 1,001. I'm going to do 1,001. Okay? And now, you see, Python has generated a list of all of these curves that are characterized by certain numbers. And this last number here is the Joshness of the curve. And what it's done is it's ranked them it's ranked them, I believe, in, I don't know if it's descending or ascending order. In any case, it's, it's ranked them in, I believe, descending order of Joshness. Yeah, descending order of Joshness. But now, it's hard to look at this list. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to look at a similar, similar simulation here. And what this is going to do is it's going to allow us to go from the one that has the largest Joshness to the smallest Joshness by me just sliding the slider. So you see, this is the correct answer. This is the curve that Alice actually travels on. And what we've seen is something very similar to what you said, not quite, which is that the unique curve has the property that it has the minimum Joshness. That's the property. The minimum. Here's what's really amazing about this fact. This was a very simple scenario. Alice was just floating from one point to another. And we pretty much knew what was going to happen if you take a Newtonian mechanics, you could have predicted this pretty easily. But this same principle, minimizing Joshness, is much more general than this scenario. And just to show that to you, I want to ask you another question. Uh, but before I do that, actually, let me show you the following slide. So it turns out, look, I want to tell you the real name. The real name for this quantity is action. And what we've just discovered is what's called the principle of least action. This is what Maupertuis had discovered in around 1740. And basically, what it says is that objects follow paths that minimize this quantity, this action quantity. And amazingly, 
this principle can be used to predict what's going to happen to any object, basically in any scenario. All you need to do is find the path that has the minimum, I'm going to call it Joshness, Joshness, and it's going to travel along that one. That's the one it chooses. Among all of the infinite possibilities, it chooses that one. And you might say, it's a very beautiful and elegant way of thinking about things, nature likes to minimize. Or, nature is stingy with Joshness, which makes sense because, as we know, it's a scarce and valuable <laughs> commodity. But I really think there's a beautiful and simple principle. Basically, the universe decides how everything is going to move just by considering all of the possible paths that a thing can take and finding the one with the minimum value of this quantity. And it does this instantaneously. It considers all infinite number and it makes the path go on the correct one in an instant, instantaneously. How does the object know to do this? I mean, it doesn't have some sort of, you know, brain. The, the astronaut is just sort of moving along. There's no you know, computer hidden someplace or someone sitting in a room calculating all the Joshnesses and then reporting to the astronaut, this is the one you should take because it's the minimum. Actually, what's very interesting about this is that Mokart thought this was such a beautiful principle that nature likes to minimize this quantity that he, being a religious man, used this to argue for the existence of God because he thought that an, a universe where motion was caused by minim, this minimization principle, being economical, could only have a God in it. Of course, modern science may disagree, but that's what he concluded. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is just ask you one more question to show you that the Joshness minimization procedure works in a slightly more complicated scenario so that you're not thinking to yourself it only works when things are moving along straight lines. So I'm going to ask you one last question here. That's strange. Uh, I'm not sure why this is happening, but that's OK. We'll just have a discussion about it anyway. Does someone want to say what they think is the correct answer to this? It is B. It is B. You might have thought it's B, but actually it turns out that when objects are moving under the influence of gravity near the surface of a planet like Earth, they travel along a curve called a parabola, and this is the one, I hope at least, that looks most like a parabola. So that's, that's what it should look like. So I'm going to show you one last thing in the simulation, showing you that in fact, whoops, in fact this works for that situation as well. Now, for any people in the audience who know a lot of physics, you're thinking to yourselves, I've left something out. I can't actually do precisely the same procedure I just did to compute Joshness. It will give me the wrong thing. That's true. That's true. There's another quantity you need in more complicated scenarios to compute the Joshness called potential energy too. The potential energy tells you something about the environment that the object is moving in. So we need to use that quantity as well, but if you just forget about that for a moment, it's pretty much the same thing, the way we compute this. And I'm just going to show you that this simulation also produces the correct curve in that case as well. So here's just some random curve that could have been the jump from some point to the hoop. And now I'm going to take this parameter lower and lower. We're going to find the minimum Joshness curve. And you can see, we do in fact get a parabola. It's no longer a straight line. And what's incredible is that you can do this for basically arbitrarily complicated situations. You could predict the motion of the planets. You could predict the motion of the entire solar system this way by minimizing Joshness. It's a really incredible thing. OK. So that's the physics. There's still a couple things remaining. That's the physics I want to discuss. Are there any remaining questions about this? Because it's really an amazing thing to get your head around when you first learn this. At least I thought so. Yes. So, not necessarily because the potential energy for each segment could be different depending on where the object is. In fact, that's one of the defining things about potential energy is that 
it sort of tells you what your energy is depending on your position. So in general, the, the potential energy for each segment is going to be different. So there's no problem like that. Yes. So there are similar minimization principles in what's called field theory in physics, where you can find a certain configuration of a more complicated object that's the correct configuration using a sim similar minimization principle, using something called an action, like here. It's just a little bit more complicated. And then there's another subject called quantum field theory that uses the same sort of idea, in fact, except just a bit modified. But the same idea, basically. Okay, so I want to conclude with the following. I just told you something I hope that you agree is truly extraordinary about the universe, the way it works. It minimizes this quantity, and that's how it determines motion for everything, in a sense. And I want to leave it with the idea that after I have told you this extraordinary thing, I would hope that the following thing would happen. So Carl Sagan, who is a famous scientist, he said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And I haven't really provided you with any evidence besides these two simulations to believe what I'm saying. And I've actually hidden all the implementation of the simulations from you. For all you know, I just rigged them so they would do what I wanted them to do, but maybe they don't. I mean, maybe if you look at my code, it's just a bunch of garbage. So you really need to have extraordinary evidence for claims like this, because I really think this is an extraordinary claim. We're saying that we can predict the motion for anything by this very simple unifying principle. Now, it turns out that there is actually quite extraordinary evidence for this. There's a lot of evidence, and I highly encourage you to try to learn more about it. But I want to leave you with another thing as well. So, I've heard a lot, especially recently, that science is being attacked. There's attacks on science, and that people want to protect science. And I don't know if that's really true more so than other areas per se eras per se. In Newton's time, for example, science was pretty rigorously attacked. It seems to me that science is always being attacked. I'm not entirely sure why. I mean, I have some ideas. But it's strange because science is actually a very simple thing. It's a very simple and general framework. It's not people sitting in lab coats someplace doing chemistry experiments. It's not people going out and doing you know, sequencing genomes. It's really a way of thinking. It's a way of approaching thinking that's systematic and embraces these three things. Evidence, openness, openness of discourse, and skepticism. And so I want to leave you with these three things and encourage you that in your life, you try to pursue a scientific view of things in this sense, in this very general sense of science, not necessarily a particular view of science that you might have at the moment. And I'll leave you with one last thing. This is a quote that sums all this up. Richard Feynman, a very famous physicist in the 20th century, said that science is a way of trying not to fool yourself. I think this is a very interesting quote because typically, and you find this the more science you learn, it's easiest to fool yourself oftentimes, especially when you're thinking about something very difficult. So you have to take great pains not to fool yourself, and it's a constant battle. I'm always doing this when I'm learning science, or anything. And I think that approach to trying as, as hard as you can not to fool yourself will oftentimes be enough, and you'll be able to clarify things. So that's all I have to say. Thank you for coming. Oh.